Well, this morning, broadcasters, as I mentioned earlier, we are moving on to part four of our uh, series on the nature and character of God. Part four, which is about God's omnipotence. And this is one of those uh, one of those theological terms that can be a little bit confusing, especially because there are like three of them that are almost the same. Omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience. Uh, that, that makes it a little bit confusing. Uh, but the reality is, is that God's omnipotence is really a, a word for God's power, God's all-powerfulness. But before we get to the scriptures and before we dive in too far to this, we want to remember uh, and thank uh, once again uh, Karen Sari, who wrote the Infographics Bible uh, and who has kindly allowed uh, me to recreate this particular graphic from that. So if you want to check that out, I know I've said it again uh, before and uh, sounding a bit like a broken record, but it's good. It really is. So check it out. Uh, if you'll remember, we have that uh, that top circle uh, or that top semicircle, which is uh, God's um, God's nature. Those are the characteristics that God has that we cannot really have. Uh, we are not really uh, we are not really created to have these things. And, and among them is uh, God's omnipotence which is what we're going to talk about today. And then on the bottom half of the circle in the dark green there is, uh, are those things that are God's characteristics that we can uh, share to some degree or another. We can grow in. And we'll be talking about, uh, about opportunities for us to grow uh, even though we do not have God's all-powerfulness. So if you look at the chart here, you can see that uh, if we strip away the other things, you have God's love, which is the context for all of this, all that we've been talking about, and also God's holiness and perfection, which is also a significant part of the context of what we are talking about. Those things, God's love and God's holiness and perfection, are not in any way, nor can they ever be, contradictory. Those things just go together uh, like peanut butter and jam, as they say. Um, and you can see that here we've stripped all these things away except for omnipotence, and that is what we are going to focus on. Omnipotence in the context of God's holiness and perfection and God's love. And in order to do that, we are going to look at Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 17 to 19. In Jeremiah 20, 32, verses 17 to 19, we read these words. Ah, sovereign Lord. Jeremiah says, You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show love to thousands, but bring the punishment for the parents' sins into the laps of their children after them. Great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord Almighty, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to the ways of all mankind, you reward each person according to their conduct and as their deeds deserve. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, before we get into God's power, we need to address a couple of things here that may be confusing for us especially in the light of Jesus Christ and his grace, uh, the grace of God that is poured out upon us. See, this passage could make it sound like you get what you deserve in this world. And to some degree, and in the next world too, in, in after we have died, and to some degree, that is true. You see, God is just, and that is important. God is just. 
he is going to do what is right, and that means that he will judge people according to what they have done. However, it is also true that God is merciful and gracious, and that if we were to really truly get what we deserve, we would be in deep trouble. This particular passage focuses on God's justice alongside his power, but it is important to remember that it is both true that in some way people are judged by what they have done, and it is true that God pours out his grace and mercy and the cleansing of sins upon all who will receive them from Jesus Christ. Those things are both true. And because our God is one unified God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and because God is self-consistent, there can be no contradiction between those things. That seems pretty strange. But think about this reality. When the Bible speaks about our coming into heaven, about our coming to see God at the end of all things, when God will come to judge in Jesus Christ the living and the dead, uh, when all are raised up again to come to his judgment seat, uh, God makes it very clear that some will be condemned by what they have done, whereas others will be welcomed into the new heaven and the new earth. Now this has very much to do with Jesus and his sacrifice, but there's more to it than that as well. The Bible tells us as well that, that some who come to heaven will come almost as if they are uh, smoking, they're singed, like they, they escape by the skin of their teeth, we would say. That they receive salvation, but either they haven't done a whole lot of anything good with that salvation, or perhaps it comes to them at the very end of their lives, like perhaps the thief on the cross, or perhaps... Uh, they have not been the wisest with the gifts that they have given. We don't know all the details about that. And God is sovereign, of course, and so God is free to choose uh, in his own wisdom what will happen. But we also hear that some will be building up treasures for themselves in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. That, that those who have done good things that God has planned in advance for them to do uh, will, be, will be getting a heavier crown in heaven. And this can be pretty confusing because God is the one who gives us the ability to do good things. God is the one who gives us the Holy Spirit and gives us salvation in Jesus Christ so that we can be adopted as children. God is the one who plans in advance good things for us to do, and God is the one through his Holy Spirit who prompts us and gives us the strength to do those things, and yet God is also the one who says to us, well done, good and faithful servant, even though, honestly, I haven't really done a whole lot of anything to deserve it. Deserved, <laughs> that is. But that is part of his outlandish grace and mercy to us as well. And so we, we recognize that there is truth to the reality that somehow, even in the midst of God's grace and mercy, it is also true that we will be uh, rewarded and or judged based on what we have done. We may receive salvation 
coming through to the new creation with our clothes smoking, or we may have heavy crowns, or we may ultimately reject God's salvation offered in Jesus Christ and receive God's judgment from that. There's also an important idea here that, that we sometimes struggle with. We have a focus in, in our society on the individual, a, a, almost an obsessive focus on the individual, whereas the Israelites did not have quite the same view, and the Bible does not have quite the same view. The Bible holds very much that there is uh, something called corporate responsibility, and we're not talking about corporate as in corporations like IBM or uh, Monsanto or whatever, although they do bear corporate responsibility as well. Here, instead, we are talking about groups of people bearing responsibility for the sin that happens uh, within their ranks, right? Even if you specifically as the individual don't do something bad, but someone else in your community does, somehow you and I, as part of that community, bear some responsibility for it. We can see this in the story of Achan at Jericho, where Achan, uh, he steals some of, the, some of the plunder that was supposed to be dedicated to God, but instead he takes it and he hides it in his tent. And all of Israel receives some punishment, consequences for this. And when finally Achan confesses his sin and the truth comes out, then not only is Achan punished, but so too his whole family, including his animals. This is an important concept, and it's really important for us today. Because some people say, well, I didn't do this. I didn't help to oppress First Nations peoples. I didn't help to oppress uh, black and brown folk. I wasn't involved in slavery or what have you. But that is contrary to the biblical understanding of corporate responsibility. We are, in some sense, responsible for the sins of our brothers and sisters, for the sins of our fathers and mothers. This is why this passage mentions that you show God, you show love to thousands, but bring punishment for the parents' sins into the laps of their children after them. There are consequences for our sins. And some of the consequences go to our children, go to our brothers and sisters, go to our community. If you want to talk more about that, or if you're wrestling with that, I would love to talk to you about that. You can, you can get a hold of me via my email address that I posted earlier, or in the bulletin you have the email address, or however you like. I would love to talk with you with you about that. But today we're going to focus on God's all-powerfulness, and so we want to reread this passage highlighting God's power. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show love to thousands, but bring punishment for the parents' sins into the laps of their children after them. Great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord Almighty, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to all the ways of mankind. You reward each person according to their conduct and as their deeds 
deserve. But let's read this passage again, because there is more to it than that. Because, of course, God only, not only does Jeremiah focus on God's power, but also his justice. So let's read again with emphasis on God's justice. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show love to thousands, but bring the punishment for the parents' sin into the laps of their children after them. Great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord Almighty, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to the ways of all mankind. You reward each person according to their conduct and as their deeds deserve. But there is more to it than that. There is also God's wisdom highlighted in this passage. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show love to thousands, but bring punishment for the parents' sins into the laps of their children after them. Great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord Almighty, great are your purposes, and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to all the ways of all mankind, to the ways of all mankind, excuse me. You reward each person according to their conduct and as their deeds deserve. As you can see, this passage highlights God's wisdom and his power and his justice. And this brings up a classic philosophical dilemma, which is the problem of evil. And I know that uh, philosophy is not necessarily your favorite thing. Uh, I, I love philosophy, uh, but there are other things that I love even more. And for some people, philosophy is just like, oh... But here's a simple, well, relatively simple, simply phrased problem anyways. If God is good, and, and maybe I should have put a capital G there, if God is really, truly, fully good, and God is all-powerful, in other words, God can do anything, God is omnipotent, then why does evil exist? Either, the philosopher would say, either God is not all good because tolerating evil is not good all by itself, or God is not all powerful because God can't get rid of evil. So which is it? Is God not all good or is God not all powerful? Another, uh, another way to put this, and another way that's maybe even more personal and hits closer to home, is this. If God is good and God is all-powerful, then why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? And thirdly, and this is not really the problem of evil, but another logical conundrum that is uh, related to all these, and we'll see that in a moment. Thirdly is the question, if God is all-powerful, can God make a rock so big that God cannot lift it? Either God is not all-powerful because he can't create a rock so big he can't lift it, or God is not all-powerful because he can't lift the rock he created that was too big for him to lift. <laughs> but these questions are all related. They are all really asking at their heart about who God is, which is what this whole series is about. Who is God? The answer, the answer to these problems is that God cannot go 
against God's own character. That's not lacking in power. That's only self-consistent. Of course, God cannot create a rock so big he cannot lift it. That's just self-consistency. The question in itself is illogical. But so, too, the answer to the other questions, the problem of evil, those questions, the answer to them is really rooted in the character of God. Because God is love, this, this constant background that we have, because God is love, God restrains God's self from instantly obliterating evil. Right? God could wipe out evil instantaneously. But because God is love, God restrains himself from doing that. God instead works to redeem and restore all things to good. Secondly, because God is love, God restrains himself from instantly obliterating, obliterating evil, and God does not force creatures like us to obey right away. God could also snap his fingers and make, make each and every one of us good, obedient little robots who do exactly what he tells us to do. But he does not do that because God is love. Because God is love, thirdly, God restrains himself from instantly obliterating evil, and instead, God gives us time, and God gives us choice, and God works to help us know our Heavenly Father. Now, just like last week, we've had a few sort of head-scratchers here. But we can identify with this. We are not all powerful. We never will be all powerful. And thank God for that, because I don't know about you. Well, no, I do know about you. If we were all, all powerful, we would mess things up. But we can relate. When our children, over whom, especially when they are little, we have a significant amount of power, when our children do wrong, we don't get rid of them and start over either. It's not like you say, oh, man, that kid stole a cookie, I'm going to send him off to the orphanage, right? You, you don't just wipe the slate clean and say, that's it, that's it, we're done with you. And if we are wise as parents, we try to work towards not having to force them to obey our commands at all. A child who grows up to obey out of their own free will is, is very much preferable to the one who does not, right? Well, if we raise a child with all kinds of strict rules, so much so that, that they have not learned how to do the good thing on their own, and we set them off into the wild, then, then what of, one of two things are, are going to happen. One is that they are going to be uh, caught like a deer in the headlights by all the things that they see that they've never seen before, or the other is they're going to go crazy and they're going to do all kinds of terrible things because they will not have been equipped to do the good thing on their own. We try, just like God tries with us, to equip them to be able to do what is good on their own. Instead, we give them time and choice, and we try to work to help them live more like they should. 
our relationships with those who do not know Jesus yet are a bit like that too. We must not try as Christians to get rid of all the non-Christians because they don't know what to believe or or don't they don't do what uh, we believe or know to be right. We don't try and get rid of them. And yet we see this tendency sometimes with people who say, oh, we need to, we need to keep immigration uh, down or keep all the immigrants from Muslim countries away or something like that. That is, that is not the way God works. God did not keep all of the people away from himself in Jesus Christ when he was here on this earth. Instead, he welcomed them regardless of their, their faith, their beliefs, their behaviors. He welcomed them and ate with them and drank with them. He wasn't afraid of being overwhelmed by them. Instead, he doesn't, just like God doesn't, snap his fingers to get rid of us. And just like Jesus doesn't snap his fingers to get rid of the infidels from around him, instead, we too, or just in the same way, we too should not try to get rid of all the non-Christians. And as we follow Jesus' example, we don't try to force them to obey our commands either. You see that historically with the, the Crusades where people were converted by having a sword at their throat and, and people saying, become a Christian or die. But you see that also, you see that also when we try to force people who are not Christians to live by our moral standards. Instead, we humbly give them time and choice, and we try to work to help them to come to know their Heavenly Father. So, we are and can grow in being God's image bearers in this too. Love does not obliterate evil without trying to redeem it. Love does not simply force compliance with the right, even if it has the power to do so. And love does patiently work at teaching and guiding the broken and bruised into the ways of love. Brothers and sisters, we are not omnipotent. But we can learn from God's way with us. God, who is omnipotent, uses his power to gently and patiently guide us into the ways of righteousness. So too we, because we do have power, need to humbly serve one another and serve God in guiding people to righteousness in guiding people to Jesus, in guiding people to his love and mercy, in guiding people to holy and righteous living. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for guiding us, for teaching us. We know that we have a long way to go, O oh God, and we ask that you would help us Help us to grow in the uses of our power. Help us to live as people who use their power just as Jesus did, humbly and as servants to all. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.